thanks so much. It's um, a pleasure to be here, and I just want to thank Alexander Vastola for inviting me to, to give this lecture. And um, it's, it's really an honor to be here and to be speaking to all of you who probably know a lot more about the, uh, many of you, about the symbols of Freemasonry than I do, but all the more reason to share this material with you and to have an exchange of um, ideas. So um, my interest, my own interest in uh, Freemasonry and art emerged maybe six years ago when I was working on a project about an artist I've written a lot about, the Spanish late 18th, early 19th century artist Goya. And for some reason it got into my head, I think he's a Freemason. Like I just could, I had some feeling about it, having read a few things and um, knowing, having studied Goya for some 20 years. So I decided to pursue the project and I'm going to share with you tonight, among other things, some of the fruit of that research and also some of the challenges of doing that kind of uh, research in which there are certain things that are not 100% certain. And um, so um, as I moved forward, I decided I became very interested in the relationship between Freemasonry and the visual arts and because symbols are so important to Freemasonry and central to art and its history, um, clearly the two developed together um, and over time. And um, so I, I decided to chair a panel of a conference about Freemasonry and the visual arts and then eventually move forward to co-edit a book of essays on the topic. Um, here, here is the, the cover, which just came out a few months ago. And um, my co-editor, Alyssa Luxemburg, teaches at the University of Georgia, so she could not join me this evening, but some of her friends are here, so I was really delighted that they uh, decided to attend. Thank you. Um, the relationship between Freemasonry and the visual arts starts to become very clear when Freemasonry is formalized in the early decades of the 18th century in England. And that formalization really occurs with the publications of the uh, constitutions of the Freemasons in 1723. And, um, and uh, the frontispiece that we see here to the Constitutions itself is a, is, a, is a beautiful work of visual art. It shows, as people have um, pointed out, that um, the quality of the print used here for the frontispiece was a very important statement that um, the publisher and the authors wanted to make. Uh, the emphasis, of course, is on architecture for reasons many of you will well know, and um, the various um, orders of architectural columns in particular are highlighted moving back into space. And um, by definition, almost the metaphors of Freemasonry are basically about art because, of course, the role of the Temple of Solomon as a metaphor for uh, moral improvement and um, reaching toward perfection is central. So architecture as one of the arts is, is key to Freemasonry itself. In addition, in the constitutions, uh, the author Anderson um, points out that um, all artists basically are Masons. So he himself emphasizes the important role of art within Freemasonry here. Nor should it be forgot that painters also, not only architects, Painters also, and statuaries, in other words, sculptors, were always reckoned good masons, as much as builders, stonecutters, bricklayers, carpenters, joiners, upholders, or tent makers, and a vast many other craftsmen that could be named, who perform according to geometry and the rules of building. So it wasn't only the architects, but basically every artist who, who was a, a mason, and indeed in the course of the 18th century as masonry spread very rapidly throughout Europe to the United States and then globally um, over the course of the next uh, century throughout the world, um, artists of all kinds became masons, and uh, many in the 18th century and many beyond, and I'm hoping to show you today a range um, of some of their work and just how quickly Freemasonry spread is very much illustrated by this print of the following decade of the 
30s. I won't go into the details of it, but just looking at it, on the placard here we see um, several rolls of images and names representing different lodges throughout the world. Uh, most of them are in England, but many of them are elsewhere in France, in Spain, um, in the United States, in um, other places much further away. And notice how for each lodge there is an image, so that once again the visual image um, art is central. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I pressed the wrong button. Let me go back. Sorry about that. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> wow, I really went far ahead. How did that? It's a new kind of remote for me, so um, hopefully that won't happen again. But if it does, bear with me. So um, I wanted to press the pointer. Oh, hmm. I thought that was going to be the pointer, but obviously it is not. So. Uh, I have someone, however, who can come to the rescue. Thank you. <laughs> so where is, the, what is the pointer? The pointer is the center button. Oh, the center button, I, okay. Okay, so you can see. <laughs> Yay. You can see each one has a little image or motif representing the lodge, reminding us of the centrality of imagery. Um, for uh, Freemasonry from really the outset of its formalization in the second decade of the 18th century. And um, also the various um, images such as the, the square that you see here are um, the key, key motifs of Freemasonry are already very present. So what I'd like to do tonight is to give you an overdue view of some case studies appearing in our book and also of a little bit my own ongoing work as well, uh, divided into four themes. The first is the most basic and uh, perhaps the most central, uh, symbols. And um, we find that the symbols of Freemasonry were um, adapted from symbols circulating elsewhere or um, that there was an exchange over time that makes it sometimes hard to know whether the symbol is in fact meant to be Masonic or was just something circulating that happens to be Masonic but also has another meaning. And a good example um, is this image, uh, post-revolutionary France of equality, egalité of 1793. And um, an art historian, a actually famous 20th century art historian, E.H. Gombrich, in analyzing this work talked about how the level and the plumb line that um, this, the allegorical figure of equality is holding. Um, in an essay he wrote, he argued that it was a Masonic symbol and that the imagery of uh, Freemasonry came to be adapted by revolutionaries and used by them to represent uh, uh, the spirit of equality that the revolutionary the revolution was uh, for many people about. Um, however, it's a little unclear whether, in fact, this artist had Masonic symbolism in mind or whether it was something um, more, a, a more general symbol of equality already circulating in other avenues. So, for example, um, here we see, I think I got the arrow now, the plumb line here that this figure is holding in this frontispiece to a Masonic magazine of the 1790s, Freemasons magazine. And notice again how imagery is so important um, to even magazines um, uh, of Freemasonry. And um, at the same time, it's also interesting that in earlier um, books of emblems, we find this imagery already existing. And these emblem books were actually really important sources for Masonic imagery. Uh, this is a 1709 version of, um, of Ripa's um, Iconographia, which is a very famous emblem book that went through many editions over the course of several centuries and in many languages. And we see here um, the plumb line with the compasses and the square all together in this in this image of judgment, uh, interestingly enough. So this is not really a Masonic image, but it does have imagery that would become Masonic. Just um, 
to point out how difficult sometimes it can be to know what the origin of an image is, whether the Masonic image was the image used by the revolutionary artist or whether the re artist was just drawing upon emblem books is not really 100% clear. Um, so um, sometimes it can help us to develop a context. And this is what I've tried to do with my own research, is to really look at the context of what was going on at a particular time, who people were, and uh, to try to understand things better that way. Sometimes the, it's obvious, of course, that the imagery is Masonic, uh, going back to the level, because the object on which it appears is clearly Masonic. And here I just want to give you an, one example of this banner of the Lodge Rising Star of West India, India from the second half of the 19th century, uh, which is um, um, the lodges of Iran and India in the 19th century are the subject of one of the essays in our book, quite fascinating. And here um, you see this level over here um, on this side of this banner. It looks like an apron, but it's actually a banner. And then um, it's also true that as these images circulate and move from place to place, they are adapted and added to other images that are unique to the place where Freemasonry is emerging. So in this case, for instance, you have the image of the fire temple, which is adapted from Zoroastrian traditions of India and Iran and taken over by um, the emerging Masons there in the second half of the 19th century. Another example is in this fascinating uh, building, again, studied in our, in our book, in which you see here the image of the fire as being so central to it. So another image in um, the Freemasons magazine that we see adapted to other contexts, other Masonic contexts, is of course the all-seeing eye here. Uh, which I show you a detail of here, and which appears in many different contexts. And sometimes it is hard, once again, to know whether it is Masonic or not. Uh, another essay in our book is about Freemasonry and Vodou in Haiti, and how the two became intertwined inter um, early on and remain so to this very day. This is a work from uh, 2011, as you can see, in which there is uh, various imagery, and there is the eye right in the center of this uh, pentacle form, and um, um, it's the work of someone who is both a Mason and involved in Vodou, which is very uh, uh, typical, actually, in Haiti, not unusual at all. And what happens is that the colonizers brought Freemasonry to Iran, to India, to Haiti, and then the people there adapted it to their own means and used it as a kind of expression of liberation. And that even happened to some extent um, in the United States, as uh, we'll be seeing a little later on this evening. So turning back now to the eye that we see um, here, I'm going to talk a little bit now about my own research on Goya. And I'm going to show you some letters he wrote to a good friend of his named Martin Zapatier, who lived in his hometown of Zaragoza, Spain. And uh, many of these letters have little drawings in them, uh, pictographs. And scholars have really puzzled over what these pictographs mean, why are they there. And this is, um, and I have a theory, obviously that's why I'm here today, that these pictographs in fact are, are Masonic and they are sort of a coded language. Now, um, during much of um, the time when, when Goya was living in Spain, Freemasonry was prohibited there. You could not practice it openly. Uh, it was prohibited by a papal bull in 1738, and the Spanish kings followed the papal bull, and the Inquisition basically sought to punish anyone who, who went against it. So any kind of practice of Freemasonry would have, would have been secretive, and that's part of the big challenge of uh, how to um, know if someone was, in fact, a Mason at this time. But um, going back now to this eye, eyes were used for many different reasons in the 18th century. Sometimes it just meant an expression of intimacy. And Goya here is using it to stand for the person he's writing the letter to, because the 
The author of the letter um, is indicated in the lower left corner, typically um, in letters that were written in the 18th century. However, um, just to go back to my point about the value of context, if we look more closely at this letter, we discover that he, the way that he, Goya signs is this word H period O, that's an abbreviation for brother, hermano. So he's signing off, um, uh, I'm seeing you, your brother, Paco. Paco is a shorthand for his name, Francisco. So um, no one ever had remarked on the way he uses that term brother. Why does, and, and so the combination then with the I is indeed, uh, to me, quite interesting. This is just a portrait uh, by Goya of the fellow he's writing the letters to. And clearly, this letter writing relationship they had meant a lot to him because he memorializes it here by painting him with one of Goya's letters. And here's a detail in which you can see uh, more clearly here your hermano Paco. And then he has this fancy signature uh, to authenticate who he has written the letter, and there are other examples. It's not only in one case where he signs off um, as brother, and there are a few other examples. Here, he's addressing, um, he's addressing his friend as brother. Again, remember that the, the addressee's name is here in the lower corner. This says, querido hermano, dear brother, um, abbreviated in here, uh, to your brother, um, Paco. Once again, and this one, a little more of the word appears in this instance. And I just want to uh, highlight the way in which in 18th century correspondence between Masons, often they would sign their letters in exactly the same way. And now I'm giving you an example in English that I found while doing research at the Grand Lodge of England in London. And this is um, the closest I could get to Spain at that time is Gibraltar. So I have this example from from Gibraltar, and you can see it's signed, your affectionate brother, also abbreviated, curiously, and then it's signed uh, W.M. Leek. So that was quite common, and people who have done research also on French Freemasonry of the 18th century have found a similar kind of affectionate way of signing off uh, your brother. In another letter, we see, in a few different letters, actually, we see something else. Um, here are pictographs within the letter itself. And this is an eye, an ear, and a mouth. So it says, to all and to eye, ear, mouth, as if referring to someone. And then um, it says, um, um, adios. And then it's, he signs off a, a strange name that he makes up. And then it says, alias blue balconies. That's, I'm just translating, balcones azules. And, if anyone has any idea about what that could mean, please do let me know. It's, it's a bit of a puzzle, and no one working on Goya has any idea what that could possibly mean. Um, but as I was doing research, um, and I was preparing to do some of my research at the Grand Lodge of England in London, um, on their website, I came upon, oh, I'm skipping ahead, so I'm just gonna skip ahead and then go back. I came upon this uh, snuff box and then other snuff boxes. This is my photograph of other snuff boxes at the Grand Lodge of England that have an eye and an ear and a mouth in the same order. The mouth here, though, instead of being locked, is sticking out, perhaps reflecting Goya's sense of humor or making fun of, of, of this uh, motto, see here, but say nothing, which was the motto of the Grand Lodge of England, actually, and that's why it appears on these snuff boxes. At one point, the motto, the motto was uh, reverse, so that you have here, see, and say nothing, instead of see, here and say nothing. And these are some other, this one is French, actually, and it has the, the words here of the motto written in French. Uh, it's very quirky with this bit of hair, hair around the ear, ear. It's a very strange looking object. Um, but these are, are quite fascinating objects, and as soon as I thought, saw this, I connected it to um, to Goya's drawing and wondered if there wasn't some kind of um, Masonic message being conveyed. And then an earlier letter has the one facial part that was missing from the ear, uh, eye, ear, and mouth, the nose. Um, this is an early letter from the 1770s where you see um, here just a nose and a hand very carefully, beautifully drawn uh, within the letter. So he's not just 
kind of whipping it off quickly, but taking some care in drawing it. And people have really, uh, scholars have really kind of uh, been challenged to interpret what this could mean. And um, believe me, some of the ter interpretations are really wacky. So this letter is from the winter, and Goya wishes his friend good travels. Of course, travel has particular meanings in Masonic context. Who knows if that's what Goya meant? But uh, one scholar of, uh, Goya's, of Goya proposed that um, because it was winter and he was traveling, maybe the idea was to keep warm. Just to show you, that, I mean, to me that seems absurd. I don't see how this this could possibly mean that. But it could mean a secrecy or not saying anything. Some people have suggested it means taking snuff, but others have argued, well, you wouldn't hold your hand like that if you were you know, enjoying some snuff. Um, and then once again, of course, there are um, gestures of the hand on the nose, and who knows, maybe um, in Masonic imagery of the 18th century, and this is um, here, um, uh, the Masons assembled for um, an apprentice, and here's a detail of uh, the man touching his nose. It's not exactly the same, and the rituals are not always the same as we move from place to place, but there is some similarity here. Um, so, Moving forward, um, Goya, before he wrote all those letters, also had traveled to Italy. And I think that, too, um, that there was a Masonic connection in that activity as well. So now I just want to look with you briefly at Europe to see. So he was from Zaragoza, which is right here. Uh, eventually, after he returned from Italy, he moved to Madrid here in the center of Spain. Traveled in the early 70s over here to Italy, spent a lot of time in Rome in that year. And in the 1990s, a sketchbook by Goya was discovered that he created beginning at that time when he was in Italy. And once again, there's lots of stuff in the sketchbook for art historians to, to study and to try to figure out. And here are some pictures of the sketchbook now belonging to the Prado Museum in Madrid. And um, here it talks about Marseille. So, um, Marseille was, I just want to go back to that map. Marseille is part of this big trade network, actually, and, um, and it's a port city with a lot of trade, and there were a lot of Masons there in the 18th century involved in international trade. Uh, the same was true, I believe, of Cadiz. I just want to point that out to you because I'm going to be returning to it a little later on. And then, of course, England, um, where a lot of these Masonic ideas were really being um, um, sent out from during the 18th century. So um, here on one page of the sketchbook there are names written, crossed out, written again, someone named Boudoin, Boudoin, and then this character Tartaron. So I started to do research and sometimes I just do it in the most simple way, typing a name into Google, right? So I'm sure you've all done that for one reason or another. So I typed Tartaron into Google and one of the things I came up with was um, a study by um, someone who's worked on Freemasonry in France named Beau Repair about um, um, trade networks and Freemasonry in Marseille in the 18th century. And it turns out that Tartaron was, he was a big businessman, but he was also um, um, a Grand Master Mason in uh, Marseille. And, um, In the um, National Library in Paris, there is something called the Fichier Bossu. Uh, this guy Bossu made all these cards of French people who he believed were Freemasons. And on here we see um, you can look, you can type up, you can type in a name actually online, and these cards will come up that he originally typed by hand. That all of them have been digitized. It's incredible, and you can see here Tartaron um, listed here and his roles. And then also it mentions um, Verrier. So I did some uh, research at um, the um, Scottish Rite Temple in Washington, D.C., which has a wonderful library. And I found this book uh, by Rene Verrier, um, which features or illustrates a lodge certificate that includes Tartaron's name. 
Um, and so I suspect that as Goya traveled between Spain and Italy, he probably stopped in Marseille and probably, uh, you know, an important um, val uh, quality of Masons was to open door to each other and to take care of each other. And so my, my theory is that that's exactly what was going on and that that's why um, his name was written here. And I think that was true in other cases as well. Um, so now I'm going to move on to my next section on trade cards. And um, sometimes um, you can find clues and information in surprising places, including the business cards of, of people working at that time. Um, this is the business card of uh, someone Goya painted who lived in Cadiz and who was a businessman involved in international trade, uh, Sebastian Martinez y Perez. And um, this is his business card which, and the, the figure of mercury, mercury is typically shown for people involved in export and trade because he's the god of, of uh, transportation and movement, and of course the ship out to sea, and then there are all these packages suggesting um, um, uh, the, the shipment of things and also a caduceus here. Um, and then also on this package though, there is a six-pointed star. Um, and so what, what is that doing there? That's a very interesting detail. Um, and this was someone who took care of Goya, by the way, in southern Spain in the early 1790s. Goya became very sick, and he ended up going to southern Spain, and he stayed at Martinez's house for a long time to recuperate. He actually was very sick and lost his hearing, his ability to hear at that time, and he lived out half of his life deaf. Um, so here's a detail of this uh, package where you see the six-pointed star. So um, in showing it to people at the Grand Lodge of England Library while I was working there, they said, well, that, that is, is the microphone working or did something He's happen? He's checking. Oh, okay. I thought that something sounded a little different. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. If you can't hear me, let me know and I'll, I'll talk louder. Um, so let's see, where was I? Yeah. So. Um, when I showed this card to the uh, librarian and the curator at the Grand Lodge of England, they said, well, Masons in the 18th century often put their symbols on their trade cards. And if you were uh, a Royal Arch Mason, you, you might well have put the six-pointed star. And they showed me actually um, albums they had, collections of these business cards, and then I found many other of them also in the collections of the British Museum. And here's some examples, uh, just so you don't take my word for it. You can see here, here's a hairdresser, and he's showing he's a mason. There's various symbols, as well as the six-pointed star. Or here, um, this um, uh, jeweler working in London, again, the six-pointed star, but also this triple tau, another symbol of Royal Arch Freemasonry. And indeed, it's quite fascinating to compare um, Sebastian Martinez's trade card to the one of this person in England where you see a similar ship uh, here out to sea. You see similar packages, once again the caduceus, and once again imagery of Freemasonry symbols on the packages themselves uh, here. And uh, here's some details just so you can see, and this is once again that triple tau which is on many of these packages, and again the six-pointed star. Yes? Right. Sorry. No. Just um, I love that as a Jewish person and think, okay, right. maybe he's the descendant of Right. No, 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 I understand. Jewish. Yeah. I understand I'm Jewish too and I can appreciate that. But um, um, the the six pointed star wasn't always used I mean it wasn't sort of the symbol of Judaism at that moment in time. And um, to be in Spain and to show you were Jewish was even more risky than showing you were a Freemason. So I just doubt, I really seriously doubt it could have been that. Um, furthermore, going back to the context issue. Could let's say questions for the end. Sorry. Yeah. Here. I don't mind. Either way is fine with me. I, I love getting questions, actually. I'm happy to get any questions. But um, I just want to point out that um, also the way the packages are, 
with the symbols and the similarities. So again, looking at the whole context and not the isolation is what I'm trying to do to you know, understand what's really going on here. I could be totally wrong. Maybe it's an unusual set of circumstances, um, but I don't think so. And uh, then portraits. So now I want to look at some a case study from our book that we co-edited about portraits and the use of symbolism actually in how the human body is positioned and then relate that also to work. I'm in, still in the middle of doing a sort of in progress work that I'll especially be interested in your thoughts about since it's not yet resolved. Um, so one of the essays, uh, actually two essays in our book concern Paul Revere. One is an essay about Paul Revere, um, who was, it's well known, a Freemason. And one was about uh, John Singleton Copley, who himself, um, as far as we know, was not a Mason. But his father-in-law, Peter Pelham, was. And in fact, Peter Pelham represented um, Desagulier, one of the founders of the Grand Lodge of England, before he came over to the United States in this print. And notice there's some similarities in the composition. So Copley has learned a few things from his father-in-law, clearly at this table and um, his elbow on it. And um, then we have objects very carefully placed here. Uh, Revere was a metal worker, and this is one of his wares that is so beautifully crafted, being shown off here in this uh, striking, simple composition. And then we have his hand in what is almost a, a square form that we see quite often in in portraits of Freemasons, so kind of like that. And another image um, that the person who wrote about Copley shows of a similar kind of thing we see here in this uh, portrait of Benjamin Franklin, as many of you know, also was a Freemason. It's a beautiful portrait, but look again as a similar kind of composition going on. And so the body um, is actually used symbolically, I think, in these portraits. Uh, to represent the square. So in my research on Goya's portraits, I noticed some portraits in which there were, the hand was configured as a circle. And it led me to wonder, uh, to, to wonder whether this too was meant to be a coded symbol of Freemasonry. It's, a, it's something I'm in the progress of work, process of working on that is a bit unresolved, so I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts. So these are two portraits in which we see this kind of thing going on. This, this man, uh, Guillaume Ardet, he was French, uh, but he was the ambassador to Spain very briefly in the late uh, 1790s. In this stunning portrait, um, he's holding his hand in a circle as if there should be something he's holding in it, but it's empty. He's not holding anything in it. It's a very obvious circular configuration. And, and actually, I've been able to find out that he was a Freemason. I'm not sure exactly when he became one, however but I have found evidence that he was. In this case, I'm still working on it. Um, this is a portrait from a few years later by uh, about um, this man from Mallorca originally who um, was an engineer. And he's holding a hat with this very vibrant red uh, lining, orangey red uh, lining. And he's holding it in a very unusual way, again, making a circle configuration with his hand. That is not a natural way to hold a hat. Um, Goya has done other portraits in which he's holding a hat, the person's holding the hat like this. That's much more, to do that is hard. I'm about to drop my paper, it's not an obvious way. So it made me think that this is a very intentional pose and it also, you know, this is the circle and here we have an angle, a similar kind of thing is going on here with the Guillaume Arde. Um, and just to show you a detail, here you can see those hands um, more clearly. So uh, there's an open question then of uh, whether this too might refer to the Mas Masonic identity of these people. And as I pursued this um, idea, I did notice that um, there were many um, portraits, uh, etched portraits done of the Italian architect Vignola uh, in many different versions. I'm just, oops, pressed the wrong button, sorry. Go back, there. Um, I just um, showing you an example from Goya's time when he was alive and you can see here um, that Vignola is holding the compasses, he's an architect, but he's also making his hand in a circle as if to embody 
what that tool creates. So I find that uh, this to be um, quite fascinating and um, so whenever I travel and especially go to uh, Masonic uh, buildings that have museums, I look at all the portraits. And I have found in Grand Lodge of England a lot of portraits where of, of, mace, of master masons with their hand on, on the table or on, on a, a Bible, uh, kind of like that, in it, making a little circle. But I've also found um, more recently an example of the hand in a particular configuration and with the compasses. Um, as if, again, they, these two things go together. I'm not really sure when this portrait was made or if it is even known, but I came across, uh, upon it last summer in Edinburgh when I went to the Grand Lodge of Scotland and had a tour of the museum there. This is a portrait of the first Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Scotland. Um, um, holding here uh, some papers with a, a cathedral, and um, here we have a uh, square and then compasses here. And it's as if his hand is configured to sort of, again, it's not, it doesn't look like a comfortable pose, but one that almost looks like it's meant to echo the shape of the compasses um, themselves. Um, this kind of uh, configuration also appears um, in later portraits. And now I'm going to give you a few examples of um, African American Freemasonry. And one of the essays in our book is exactly about photographic portraits of African American Freemasons and Odd Fellows, uh, members of the Odd Fellow group in the 19th and 20th centuries. And um, uh, these are interesting to me because the groups make a configuration of a kind of V or almost like a compass form, as we see here. And this is Arthur Schomburg, who um, the, um, the New York Public Library branch of African American history is named after him because he donated a lot of materials uh, to it. And he's, he's back here in this uh, photograph. And then here in this photograph, we see um, these two men creating a V with their knees as they come together in the foreground. So uh, leading me to ask if this kind of um, what, body symbolism, shall I say, um, doesn't appear in many different kinds of contexts, and even in figurines. Um, and another essay in our book uh, is about figurines created in Germany in the 18th century. Um, by the famous Meissen porcelain factory. And actually, at the time this work was made, and this is the first Masonic um, uh, piece of porcelain made at this factory, the director of the factory was a Freemason himself. And um, here we see a hand, again, with there are various objects on this column, uh, square and compasses and other objects, and almost a kind of circular configuration. Uh, another example from the following year of uh, two men, and you can see a globe here, and again, the uh, compasses, um, and then very specific poses of their hands, again, showing the, um, perhaps, again, making this kind of compass symbol or some other symbol that has very particular meaning. So um, the way in which the body sort of takes over these visual symbols is quite fascinating. Um, I think. Um, the essay about Meisen, actually, in our book, um, is about uh, an order, uh, not Freemasonry, but something called the Order of the Pug Dog, one of the more fascinating sort of side developments out of Freemasonry. And pug dogs were very fashionable at the time in the 18th century. You see one right here. And they also, like all dogs, were loyal, but apparently were known to be especially loyal. And the thing about the order of the pug dog is that both men and women could become members. And um, the person who did the research on, on this um, um, for, for our book discovered that um, actually all of the men who were in the order of the pug dog were also already Freemasons. And so she speculated that this was a way to meet like-minded women and to hook up. It was almost like a, a kind of dating thing which is even suggested by the configuration of the figurines themselves. Uh, this is when you can, this one, I, I took this photograph because this work was actually now on display at the Metropolitan Museum. You can go and look at it. You see this man is a mason. There's his apron under here. And here on, the, on her lap is this uh, pug dog looking very similar to the one down here. And she's serving him chocolate in this kind of, you know, 
flirtatious um, manner. Um, so um, I'm hoping that then with this overview, I've given you a good idea of the sheer range of art that responded to Freemasonry, um, that both influenced it and responded to it, some of uh, my own avenues of research, some of the challenges involved and question marks that still re remain, and it's a lot there, so it's slow, but it's gonna change, there we go. Uh, the sheer quantity of material, kinds of materials, and um, range of questions, people and places that it involves. Uh, so thank you very much.